Twin Views in 2016, and as adversary. This was the most horrific thing he could have Advocacy. Mm -hmm. This concept of you just lost the love of your life, and now this man is here who is just like the love of your life, except straight, and you cannot be with him. And, and so John just made this long essay about why Russell's awful. And then another author, uh, Naaman Zillin, he wrote an essay for us about how excited he was about Mickey because clearly Mickey was gay. And for him, he read all the text completely differently and was like, this text is so great because I finally have a, you know, this bisexual, or gay or bisexual character that I can identify with, a, a man of color, and clearly he and Jake get together and they travel because they obviously have been fighting something in Paris, so Mickey has decided, you know, he's probably going to fall in love with Jake. And it, it was lovely because these were two completely, and I was able to put the essays back to back when we sequenced. So that one person calls out that moment and another person says, and this is the moment I found transformative to me. You know, and, and in both cases, neither one was a point of view I had entered with as an editor. But I was like, okay, I can, I can have both these points of view, one I disagree with, one I like better, but this is great. Mary, I'm going to get you to catch up now. Sure. So introduce yourself and your uh, your anthologies for advocacy, what you've done, and then um, pros of doing that, and then do your editorial and advocacy concerns ever, do they mesh, do they clash, where do they do that? So okay. go! <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Mari Green. Um, I'm a professional LGBT writer. Uh, primarily I'm an essayist and a journalist, but I also do write fiction. Someday someone will publish that fiction. <laughs> Um, my essays have appeared in a number of publications, most prominently in Otter Straddle, Bustle, Salon, Bitch Media, Every Feminism, Daily Dot, Flavor Wire, probably like four more I've forgotten because I everyone publishes my stuff, which is nice. Um, I just wish people published my fiction. <laughs> um, so um, I'm also a, uh, a former scientist and a genesis for about a decade before I became a writer. Um, and I found out that they don't really like gay men well <laughs> So I became a writer instead. Um, so um, I have like three stories over anthologies right now, and there's cross that are all LGBT specific. Um, okay, um, anthologies and advocacy. So um, I come with this from very much both a queer and a trans perspective. Um, from a position where trans writers are basically entirely erased from every genre forever. Um, so, you know, there are a few examples where that's not the case, but, um, you know, for the most part, it's very, very hard to get published as a trans writer, um, mostly just because the trans perspective on things is often very, very uh, foreign to people, and particularly like straight editors. Um, so, when you start writing things with trans characters or any you're using trans characters, who are not super interested. So, um, a lot of the best literature written by trans people is coming out in anthologies or in like trans specific imprints like Top, top, top Side. Um, so, um, I just quoted from three just mentioned those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Tom and Jerry is a really good friend of mine. So, um, I, that's actually they have a hopefully a, they have a, they have a spec based anthology uh, written by the trans people coming out. 17, I think, and yours across the way pieces in it. Um, so, um, I, you know, other you know, awesome things being done are things like Queer Story Science Fiction, which I'm sure you guys have already talked about. I'm sure um, I haven't talked about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, well, nope. that's funny. Uh, <laughs> I'm in it. You know, um, and I, I like that to become sort of a yearly thing. Um, it's a chance for a lot of otherwise unheard of writers to get some of their stuff read. Um, it provides sort of a gateway. Um, where there are already you know, there are so many barriers to entry for writers um, that when you can at least you know hone the genre you know hone the you know the specifically to you know a marginalized group that adds a lot of um, you know possibilities for folks who might not always get read and that becomes very important uh, also for people of color particularly queer people of color and that there are some really nice yeah. well, 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 next year that I have been able to um, do a little bit of the like, credit of editing. Um, I do, um, I work for a magazine called Harlot, which is actually a, this is on sexuality, it's a very much that's what I'm trying to make people of color, um, more than one of those things, disabled women, um, 
it. So the problem is, of course, tokenizing. Um, you know, it's and also like the notion that you know, if you don't ever let uh, marginalized books advance beyond publishing in anthologies, specifically for marginalized folks, um, there's just no. That's the dead end for us. Um, it's nice to be in a book, but you know, if none of us are actually able to make a living as writers, um, in a lot of ways, our stories, you know, aren't getting told still. Um, so, I mean, that's to give a, a broader example of that. That's not particularly in, in drama fiction as far as um, books go, but um, a really big problem with that in like television Hollywood right now. Uh, stories about trans people are super, super popular. Um, stories written by trans people, acted by trans people, are not very popular. Um, and, you know, if you want to look at glaring examples, you know, look at one, you know, a few episodes of the show Transparent, um, compared to a new web series that was all trans produced, trans written, trans acted, called Her Story, which is amazing, you should watch it. Um, so, um, that's sort of my, my brief. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so, so either as a writer of stories and anthologies, or as an editor of them, do you give or receive any guidelines for them? Uh, I did find that when I did the uh, one for mental health, I did get quite an extensive thing of guidelines, which basically boiled down to be sensitive and don't be stereo stereo stereotyped, which to me is obvious if you're going to write about mental health, but obviously had to be said. So do you give any guidelines? Absolutely. Without a doubt. I'm, with each of my anthologies, I'm the first one who's like, I want to do women in fiction. It's all women writers. I want women as your main character. That's the only thing I care about. I want it to be a woman. And I want it to be about women's issues in life. Not not necessarily like, this is a woman's issue, but this is, this is life and this is what happens to women. And that's what I want. And then the second, my second anthology was, I want the other. So it can't, it, it, it can be women, a woman, and she can be straight, or it can be a man, and, and and you know, not straight, and, but basically I don't want a straight white man. <laughs> Anything but that, I will, I will be thrilled to, uh, to publish. Um, and, and it was overwhelmingly, oh, I have that story, which was so unbelievably positive and really affirming and Really well, um, which I think is rare. Rare it, to it's rare to have so many people so in, invested in it and for it to have such a positive reception because it came out before all of yours and I'm not and and, and I think you really laid the groundwork for for that positive reception and you you blew the hell out of the publicizing of it. And it was just wonderful to see. <coughs> And it's a wonderful example that I, I've never seen before. Um, yeah, I think when, like, when we started, I mean, because there was the, like the chicks in chain mail kind of stuff. Yeah, it was, and, you know, it's tongue in cheek. And but it was tongue in fun, cheek and walking the line between. Uh, yeah. and, and it all too often it, it falls the wrong way. Not the wrong way, but the easy way. So, Michael down there. <laughs> that Michael. <laughs> Guidelines. I know I have very minimal guidelines. Lady Churchill's has very minimal guidelines. I uh, was very lucky in that Lady Churchill's, in my opinion, wears its politics on its sleeve. Catherine Grant is full of like communist uh, <laughs> stuff. So like, so I, I said very little uh, that one sentence about what how people interact with Europe, and uh, I ended up buying. 17 stories from women and two stories from men, and like half the stories from women had some queer element. Uh, so, and I didn't have to do anything, I just got out of the way. So, I, I feel very lucky. And, uh, super easy. Did most of the things that you received, were they what you were looking for? Like, did most attempt to follow that at least very basic guideline? Uh, surprisingly, or yes. were there some that were just clearly submitting for this book or the sake of submitting? Clear, so, yeah, some were, <laughs> but, but less than I expected. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you accept any of those? Of the ones that were, they were everything that I bought was unexpected to me. Uh, the story that Sophia Samatar sent me, it's it's set on a spaceship above the Earth. You, you don't even she looks out at it and blue and green and beautiful. And the whole rest of the story is her ranting about 
uh, the main character ranting about uh, being downtrodden for being a woman of color, and like her experience with uh, dominant white culture uh, has has sent her to flee to the space station where she spent the last twenty years with two cats, and like, and and I'm like, well, that's that's about her relationship with Europe, and it's awesome, so I'm putting it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh God, so some of the anthologies I've written for um, have very, very specific guidelines. Um, I'm particularly thinking of it's not out yet, but we have think next year. Being edited by Toby Hill um, which focuses, it's actually not genre fiction, but it's uh, sexualized fiction um, written by trans women, or trans people, um, preferably female trans women, it's actually, but, um, where she's very specific about, you know, writer must be trans, like, the bulk of the content must be trans-related, like you must have more than one trans character, you cannot have an all-white cast unless you have a very good reason for having an all-white cast, like, very specifically, like, I don't want to see the same, like, shit that is published everywhere um, by, like, the same four white trans girls who get all their shit published. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, places like Topside Press um, tend to be a little bit more, uh, because they attract a very specific audience, uh, a very specific writer staff who usually submit to them. Um, they tend to be able, they are a little bit more buzzy about even whether or not um, your content had to be, you know, translated as long as the writer was, you know, identified in that way. So, um, I've seen others, you know, I mean, it's, when you're, when you're dealing with especially queer anthologies, um, you know, it's an interesting, interesting thing. Um, and whether or not you're looking for an anthology of queer content yeah. Or an anthology of queer writers, or an anthology of queer content written by queer writers, um, because you can have straight people writing queer content. You could have queer people writing more or less straight content. And you could have queer people writing queer content, and it's a matter of, um, and everyone is kind of looking for something different, um, and that's fine, usually. I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, part of this also depends slightly on: am I soliciting from someone, and, or is this an open call? Um, you know, solicitation, I almost have, because I know my writers, or the writers fairly well, so I can have almost a shorthand. I want to give them a certain amount of room, but I do want them, these are the, these are the bullet points of what we're doing, you need to hit this. And actually, you brought up a good one with, um, with Queer State Time Lords, <coughs> not every writer I approached, and you know, some of them, you know, like one of them, uh, Gary Russell, who'd been script editor on Dr. Who Torch, with his old friend, he doesn't like writing about the gay experience. And he, in fact, hates writing about it and hates reading about it. He just wanted to write about a little bit of that, but mostly talk about his life in Doctor Who. And I was like, for me, that was fine, because that, that is still one of the journeys of someone who is queer and, you know, worked on, you know, had a Doctor Who story to tell. You know, but, you know, with open calls, a weird thing, like, like, Literary Mayhem was not technically political, but because of the writers we got, and because it was a nightclub and roller derby anthology created over a few <laughs> weeks, it ended up being, and if you ever have seen this Galen Darren cover, um, it was, it's queer as fuck. So it, it, I think 75% I think of the stories end up Stephen sending to Steve for the best of. You know, please consider everything. As it turns out, every, every story has a character. That qualify. But I think sometimes it's characters, sometimes it's the writers. But you, know, you, you work with certain writers, you know it's going to kind of, if you're soliciting, you may start with an anthology that you don't necessarily think your topic is specifically political, but you gather a certain group of people, and it's going to end up down that, you know, they're going to take political routes, ideological routes down. And so yeah, so suddenly I had a, in some ways, Glitter and Mayhem is more queer than Queerstick Time was, when it was all said and done. So one, qu the, one question in here that I would like to ask. How are such books received and reviewed by the field, both politically and aesthetically? <laughs> <laughs> you knew that one was coming. It's right in yeah, the middle of the blur. Go. <laughs> so anyway, to bring back to Lightspeed's Queers Destroy, um, my when I was asked to write an essay for Queers Destroy Science Fiction, it ended up being the essay they launched the Kickstarter on, um, it was about my Queers Day Time Lords experiences. And part of it was, and I had heard, there had been a certain amount of blowback on women destroy science fiction. And a lot of it was, um, well, not, not one of the blowback came was, yeah, we already know this. Why are you doing this special issue? Clearly, the, the, the war has been won. It's over. It's fine. And it, it's like, well, no. And you know, 
what, when I did Queer as Dick Time Lords, I, a whole series of things happened to me. You know, and I actually start with an Am with a, a kind of a homophobic Amazon review. You know, the one star Amazon review about you know kind of you know shoving political ideology ideologies down people's throats, and it's just a show. And who are these people? You know, and, and then just all these little review mic like for me, um, the press that I worked with and that did the Chicks books, they had, had all been reviewed in Doctor Who magazine, which is kind of this main big magazine for all Doctor Who fans. And, actually is the biggest selling science fiction magazine in, in, in paper in the UK. And um, they didn't review ours. This was the one book they skipped. Queer Stick Time Lords, just not there. No, no reason, you know, they had it, you know, but suddenly they couldn't find a reviewer. You, you, you realize sometimes that there's all these little microaggressions where you start kind of connecting the dots and go, ah, okay, this is being received this way. I mean, I had one actually prominent gay Doctor Who fan call me out saying, that because I'm a married, you know, even though I identify gender queer and bisexual, because I'm married to a bisexual woman, I've lost my queerness, and therefore should, and I should not be allowed to edit this. And he told people not to. Uh, he actually went around, and there's a whole bunch of people I was asking who would not talk to me because he was going around telling people to not work with them because I don't believe he's queer enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, that I mean, that's that's really proud of the community. I mean, that's and so you get it. The other interesting divide is how are things received within marginalized communities versus yeah. how they're received in the wider fandom community. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm, it's about what I it's what I deal with is trans literature. Um, I you know read review a lot of trans literature because they work in media. Um, it's one of those things that's often you know there things that are written by trans people are often very very well received in the in you know trans community. Very, very poorly received everywhere else. Um, again, not to, there's not a lot of good, unfortunately, spec fic written by trans people that's been published yet, which is very sad. But uh, a classic example I can think of is um, some of the guys from Stuff from Topside. Um, their first big collection called The Collection um, is probably on the bookshelf of every trans person that I know. Um, and every straight person that I know that's picked it up is like pronounced dead garbage. Um, unrelatable, absolute terrible garbage. Um, and I like it's because it doesn't relate to your experiences and you're not used to reading things that don't relate to your experiences. Um, I think the most powerful like of those that I, I um, you know, it's very divisive that I've seen um, between like, trans people and cis people is um, a book by Sybil Lamb called I've Got a Time Bomb, uh, which is a very, it's about, it's about a queer trans woman struggling with like poverty and addiction um, in Canada. Um, and it's very graphic and it's very, blunt, um, and it's very real for most of us who live that sort of life, um, and most of people just can't stomach it. Like, they get about 30 pages in, and they're like, nope, I don't really need to read about this much rape. Um, so, um, but it's also very much based on Sybil's life, so it's, you know, it's turned in a very sort of almost, um, almost science fiction direction, which is a lot of fun, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's sort of, you know, and that comes down to you know what is your audience when you're, you're putting together an anthology? Are you gearing it to be primarily you know, read by queer folks or by people of color or by you know disabled folks, or are you trying to you know, reach a broader audience with stories that you know feature or you know um, explain the experiences of marginalized folks? So, um, but yeah, uh, a lot of fortunately a lot of stuff, particularly geared you know designed to bring out the stories of marginalized folks folks who don't deal with marginalized identities don't relate to, and then they have really negative reactions to it. Um, because they dislike not seeing themselves represented and don't under then don't appreciate the irony of that um, when most of us deal with that all the time. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I have a huge amount to add. Uh, <coughs> I've got a dozen more things. You, you, kind of took, you, you took my notes, so. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two other, two other anecdotes for other projects. So. Anecdotes uh, are good. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, I, this article, it's, um, it's this interview with these two <laughs> topside press editors, and, uh, and it's really good, and it talks about some of the stuff you just talked about and uh, some other things, and it is online, it leads. Who does they actually interview? Good question. I will, I've, their names have gone out of my head. And, uh, it, it's at bit.ly slash backfic. Oh, so yep, so I know exactly who that is. That's, that, that, that's Kat Fitzpatrick and uh, Casey Platt. Yes, that's those names. Friends of mine. <laughs> uh, so, 
I could parrot them or I could just tell you where to go. So that's <laughs> what you, you took all, literally, you took uh, all my talking <laughs> points. I have nothing to add. All right, then. Go ahead, because we, we want to hear them. <laughs> okay, so reviewing to other projects. The, 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 the one opens up the, the since you, you brought them up already. Um, so Chick Stick Time Lords did win a Hugo Award. Um, and it won where, you know, if you look at the statistics, there was a lot of people out of nowhere nominated and, you know, came in second, kind of high line book by like three nominations. And then won pretty steadily in each round with a lot of people, a lot more than the contributors. Um, there are two gentlemen who exist on the internet who have ran some things about the Hugo Awards. <laughs> And um, they both... We have no idea. <laughs> they both claim that by the nature of Chicks, in fact, this is why Chicks Take Time Lords was featured in the Wired article, um, the fact that it won proved that there was a liberal conspiracy about this award. And that we clearly had somehow orchestrated, because no one would ever be interested or enjoy this. I mean, obviously, no one read it. But no way this thing could have won, because clearly we've moved these things around. And it's and you think, when people say, oh, why do you need this thing? And then you read that kind of thing that an all-woman anthology can only win an award if there's a conspiracy. You know. And this happened, there is a reviewer who, as of now, is no longer a reviewer. But we did an issue of our magazine on Candy last year. And um, just by happenstance, it was all women in the issue. And I think that happened twice that year, by happenstance. Because that's just what happened. Um, but this reviewer did this whole thing about how how they, how they enjoy hamburgers, but they don't want to eat a whole bunch of meals by, that are hamburgers in a row. <laughs> and that all the hamburgers start tasting the same after a while. And you know, it was like, just angry that how, how dare we put all, all these women writers together, even though their stories are completely different, not even close. But because they're by women, they have, they're actually, they actually have to be the same story. And her reasoning was because they're written by women, with women, women protagonists, therefore they're all the same story. But if you yeah. wanted to read a steak, you would put the hamburger down and get something else. That is the most bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. It, it, was, it was one of those things where I just backed away because you don't argue with reviews, but this person's now gone, so I feel like I'm bringing it up now. You know, and just let the internet do it for me, you know, because other people are like, I mean, this reviewer is known for saying things like this. But yeah, it's. And this was months ago. This is not like I'm talking distant past here. We're talking six months ago. Yeah, and Mari was uh, mentioning something about people not wanting to uh, read something that doesn't reflect their experience. I always thought that's what fiction did, that it was about just in, you know, going through somebody else's experience, experiencing a different life. So how do you find that in the anthologies you edit or the stories you read? Are you finding that they are picking up the audience beyond the actual people that they reflect? So uh, Yanni, were the uh, fantasy medleys attracting male readers? Or were you finding, were you getting any sense of that? Were, was there any blowback to that? Um, yeah, yeah, there was a lot of things. And they were very clearly appealing to women, um, by and large. Kind of preachy. I don't know if it's really my thing, but and, uh, somebody, uh, you know, the chicks will dig it. Uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, yeah. yeah there it is. Yes. 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 Oh. I, I think uh, this is sort of what I was saying earlier, but it's hard to convince people with fiction. Uh, like I. Stuff about experiences I haven't had. Uh, I hasn't always been that way. When I was a teenager, I wanted to read about teenage boys with laser guns. Uh, but I, you know, grew up. Uh, but when they're young, it's scary and, and it, it angers you to read things outside of your experience. Some no. some people, right? Like I can't I can't make that like. And that, I, I mean, and I that, I, I've that. seen it a lot. Yeah, actually, sure, sure. You or uh, <coughs> but I think that there's a way to write. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's Marissa. Stuff. 
<laughs> I will say for what I write, um, I do write it depends on what I'm, where I'm publishing. Um, I, one of the things I love about working in August Draft, August is a very specific queer women's magazine. Um, it is the, it's called, yeah, they bring themselves as the, you know, the paramount of, of girls in the um, Which means I can write really queer shit. I can write really queer, inside, like full of inside queer, queer girl jokes that I can't write anywhere else because no one else will publish that shit because you know, the larger straight audience of Bustle isn't going to be interested about my like random musings about like weird gay girl pop culture. Um, so, you know, there's always, you know, sort of this um, you know, interesting way that I, you know, when I'm writing you know, the nonfiction or writing like, you know, I do a lot of personal essay type stuff, um, primarily because there's just not a lot of really good personal essay stuff being written by trans folks, um, because it's hard to get people to write about their lives because people are terrible. Um, but even there, you know, I tend to be a little bit selective about a, who I publish, who's writing with, um, because uh, I don't, I, primarily because I don't like people owning the rights to my shit forever, um, which is me off, um, which is another thing actually would be interesting to talk about in there. Um, but um, I have found that the vast, I mean, you know, when I'm trying to write fiction, I, I do write for trans audience, mostly because you just need it so bad. Um, and for a queer audience, for that matter, too, I do write um, you know, non trans queer fiction. Um, because it's just, it's just still so badly needed. There's still such a dearth of it. Um, so my biggest concern is that like the people that I care about and the people who I you know, want to feel affirmed and happy reading it feel that way. Um, and I do, you know, I have had people, you know, straight people who read my stuff and they're like, oh my God, this is terrible. But I also have enough, you know, folks who are straight men or straight women who, you know, message me, email me, and tell me that the stuff they've, you know, they've written has like changed their perspective and like hearing about, you know, experiences or you know, some of the like, little bits of short fiction I published in various places, um, you know, actually like, oh, I understand this in a new way, and now it's less scary to me, or, oh wow, I did not understand that like that's a thing that, you know, that basically every trans person ever is probably at least very strongly contemplated suicide and. More than half of us have tried um, that kind of thing. So, I think everything we've done um, to some degree has targeted, you know, because we are in a certain community. But we've had enough things go viral and go outside that I've seen it. You know, like okay, um, we edited a story by Rachel Sorcy for Apex Magazine called "If You Were a Dinosaur, My Love," and that was a one where when Lynn and I both read it, you know, we read it very much from a queer reading. And within the queer community, a, that was going to resonate as a hate crime story, you know, beautiful little fable thing. And then it went viral. And it's amazing how many people still saw it as that, and it did make them think about some stuff. Others saw it as a threat to them. And, you know, it went, it went you know, in different places. You know, Chicks Dick Town was the same way where we thought, that we wondered, this, this is only gonna be like a fangirl thing. And, the fan, and in many ways it was, the fangirl, you know, fangirls who are cosplaying, to, you know, and now these huge in Comic Cons and stuff. Yeah, they, they did buy it, but also a lot of men did, and a lot of men did say, "I hadn't heard these stories," and this this made me think. And you know, I think it did it did expand out. I think if you have quality, quality will always kind of it'll start seeping out beyond your target. You know, we hope. We hope. We certainly hope. And sometimes yeah. it will. I think fiction can be transformative. I think a good essay. Weirdly enough, since you brought it up, like our number one piece on Uncanny right now, ever is it was written as a personal memoir by a gender queer man about about toxic masculinity and fighting against that, <laughs> right, by David J. Schwartz, and that is you know, and it, it is super viral for us. That 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 did you know, and I did not expect that because when I read it, you know, and I'm reading it, and I'm. Editing it, trying to, because once again, it did actually have a lot of inside stuff, a lot. Like Lynn actually was talking about, and I'm very much extremely what he's talking about. But, um, you know, but there was, you know, there was stuff there where I had to go, okay, we have to expand this so that a general audience understands. Like, we can't, like, throw out the word quote back, which I, like, you know, not, not a general read, but yeah, it was like, it's amazing if you, if the writing is powerful enough, and if, if you shape it as an editor with your writer, it can reach beyond just your target, and, and you know, and have, and then these conversations start. And it's fun, 
when, especially now on the internet, when you're internet publishing, to kind of be able to watch the conversations evolve around the place. Questions, I'm gonna throw it out, do we have any questions? Um, I was wondering about if you were doing a new piece of advocacy or if you were a new editor for advocacy about labeling, because I've been reading a lot of Monk